My dear friends, In this meditation, I am going to try to describe to you what it means to be a Christian and what it means to be a saint. First of all, how did Christ come to be in this earth? For well, one day an angel came out from the great white throne of light and came down to a virgin kneeling in prayer and said to her, Will you give God a human nature? When she discovered that she was not to lose her virginity to give God a human nature, she agreed. So God then took from this woman a human nature through which he taught us, he governed us, and he sanctified us. One day, maybe while we were yet infants, we were called by God and asked, Will you give me your human nature? God wishes to continue the incarnation. As Mary gave him a human nature, he continues his incarnation by us giving him a human nature. Now this had to happen too with a little flower. From our earliest memories, she always wanted to be God. So she always offered to him her human nature. Now not every one of us give our human nature to God in the same way. He gave hers completely and totally. Let me give you an example by this, this pencil. This pencil is very supple and flexible in my hand. If I want the pencil to write the word God, it will write the word God. It's totally subservient and obedient to my will. Suppose, however, this pencil had a will of its own. When I wanted to write the word God, it might write the word dog. I couldn't do anything with it. Why? Because this pencil would not be completely obedient to my person. And so not every one of us give our human nature to God in such a way that he can use it totally and completely. We hold back. One of the disturbing things in our modern world is, for example, that young people should be concerned with what they call the problem of identity. Who am I? Can you imagine living 15, 20, 25 years not knowing who we are? When are we happy, really? We're happy when we give our human nature to someone else. In marriage, for example, man gives himself to a woman. In religion, we give ourselves to Christ. In the little flower, there was never any question of Therese wanting to be Therese. She never had a problem of identity. She just wanted to be his. And to be here so totally and completely that anything that the good Lord wanted to do with her, he could do. Like a, a Russian a Russian novelist of, uh, once wrote it himself, he said that when he was in Siberia, he said, if God wants to use me to stuff up an old apple, I'm very willing. Now God doesn't use us all in exactly the same way just as the director of an orchestra does not use every musician in the same way. And in, in a drama, the actors play different roles, but when the curtain goes down, 
We're not asked what role we played. We are asked how well we played the role assigned to us. So if we give ourselves completely to God, to Christ, then we played the role well. Now coming back to the little flower, she gave herself so perfectly to the good Lord. But did you, did you know she sent out a kind of a, of a wedding invitation? She wrote it out one day. Because she was going to give herself to her divine spouse. And this was prompted by a cousin of hers who was being married. And I'm going to read you the invitation that she sent out. And in the invitation she says, that, well, you were not able to attend, for example, uh, the ceremony, but there will come an eventual day when we get back from our honeymoon, that is at the end of time, when you will meet us. Now, this is the invitation that she sent out. She wrote, apropos of the marriage of her, of her cousin. And she writes in her own story, eight days afterward, my cousin Jean got married, and I can't tell you how anxious I was to learn her example about all the attention which as a bride she lavished on her bridegroom. And I wanted to know all I could about it, because surely my attitude toward our Lord ought not to be less carefully studied than Jean's attitude toward her husband. So I amused myself by sketching out a wedding invitation of my own, modeled on hers. But she's the bride. Who's the bride? It's Christ. She's not going to belong to anyone else. And this was the, the little sketch that she wrote. Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, Lord of the whole world, and the glorious Virgin Mary, Queen of the heavenly court, invite you to take part in the wedding of their son, Jesus Christ, King of kings, Lord of lords, to Therese Martin, now invested by the right of dowry with two freedoms. To Sir Louis Martin, they are in chief of the misfortune and the humiliation, and Madame Martin, lady-in-waiting, invite you to take part in the wedding of their daughter to raise to the Lord Jesus. We, we don't think generally, you know, of souls being so completely dedicated to the good Lord that to them it is a wedding. Trees must have been there for a rather a playful little spirit to have ever thought of a wedding in these, these particular terms. And then she goes on to say, you are not able to say be present at the announcement, as to say the day of her final vows. But she said the Lord is coming on the last day, and when he comes, then we will celebrate the wedding together. Now this does not mean that anyone in this life, for example, who is committed to a human life is any less Christ. Remember that married love does not stand in the way of a Christ's love. The, the only difference between, for example, priests and religious who have committed themselves to speaking to God and the married people is that we give ourselves directly to it. And the married give themselves indirectly. But they are his. Totally. Now suppose that a number of worldly people heard this sermon up to this point. Suppose they saw the picture of this young girl who dies at 24 years of age and are struck by what well, certainly the purity of her expression and a beauty to which one cannot be totally indifferent. What would the worldly person say about anyone giving oneself so completely to Christ that she writes out a wedding invitation. They would say it's a waste. They 
do the good she could do in the world. Wouldn't she have been a wonderful wife? Maybe she could have done social work. That would have been the argument. But, remember that in the divine order, some lives have to be wasted. Wasted. From the worldly point of view. Take, for example, the, uh, the woman who came into Simon's house. A lot of her feet at a table. This woman comes to the house, and she does not attempt to brush her hair back because it acts as a screen against the gaze of the Pharisee. And she stands over the feet of our Lord, takes from around her neck a vessel of precious ointment, and breaks it. It was a custom very often among the Jews to break a vessel of precious ointment over a dead body and then to throw the remains of the glass into the coffin. Well, she breaks this vessel of precious ointment over the feet of our blessed Lord. Judas, who was there, said, well, why all this waste? Could have been sold for 300 pence and given to the poor. And our Lord immediately came to the defense of that weight. Our Lord said, she has done this for my burial. Because our Lord was within ten days of the crucifixion. She's done it for my burial. In other words, there are certain things in life that we waste. We're seemingly prodigal about them. The life of the little flower was that way about her own life. And this pious woman was prodigal about the giving of precious perfume. Take, for example, David, King David, who lived a thousand years before Christ, and who was the model of, of the kingship of Christ. Uh, King David was fighting a battle against the Philistine near his old hometown, which was Bethlehem, where Christ was to be born a thousand years later. And as many a man, when he goes back to his boyhood town, has memories of what happened. He had recollections of the water of Bethlehem. And he said, if I could only have some of that water from the well of Bethlehem. The enemy line was between himself and that well, with water he tasted when he was a boy. And a few of his brave soldiers said, we'll go through the lines and get the water. And they did, they went through the enemy line and brought the water. And when they did, David took the vessel of water and poured it out. He said, water purchased at such a sacrifice and not be taken as a drink. If he had drunk that water, we would not be telling that story now. But when it became precious because it was offered in sacrifice, you see, gold that is sorted makes one a miser. Knowledge that is selfishly possessed makes one proud. Flesh that is too cared for turns into lust. It is the things that are spent, wasted for God's sake, that become remembered through history. And so we tell the story of David because he wasted the water as the woman wasted the perfume and as the little flower was wasting her life on Christ. This is the secret of being a good Christian. To be his. What difference does it make really what we're doing? Too often we think that we have to be in a noble position Please the good Lord. Remember when the Lord gave ten talents, five talents, one talent, 
or gifts. Who buried the talent? The one with the ten? The one with the five? No, it was he who received one talent. He said, well, I don't have very much. I'm not worth anything, so I'll bury it. But our Lord held him responsible for that one talent. We may not have a very important position in the world, but at least we have one talent. And if we use it in the Christ-like way, it would be wasted. Wasted for Christ. And this is really how we get strength. Now I do a great deal of talking. In priest retreats I talk five times a day for four or five days straight and 35 to 40 minutes each time. Well, that takes a lot of energy out of a 39-year-old man. Why do you laugh? And so some people would say, well, why do you do this? Why do you spend yourself? Simply because the Lord wants me to do it. If I sat, I can't ignite any fire if I sit. That was one of the reasons why when I first started teaching, I started teaching at Westminster Seminary, London, England, and when was it? 1924. I took a resolution that in teaching I would never sit. I would always stand. The students had to stand for me, I would stand for them. But the point is that as we spend our energy, we get it back. The little flower took goodness, virginity, sweetness, innocence, wasted it all on seed. But now it comes back a hundred thousand fold. The wheat is not kept in the barn. It's wasted. It's when we save ourselves that we begin to lose power. This then is the is how the incarnation is continued. And may you all be flexible, supple, obedient instruments of the good Lord. And very often during the day pray to him for you and you. I often do that. If I go out for a walk, I will often say to the good Lord, all right, now use me. When he does use me, and it costs me a lot of money generally, but he uses me. I run into people who need it badly, and, or someone who is sick. But we have to offer ourselves with pencils. Let him write poetry, let him write prose, let him scribble. What difference does it make? This is happiness. Remember how St. Paul put it in his, in the conclusion to his letter to the Romans. Let's see, the end of the eighth chapter of the Romans. Uh, this is one of the really magnificent passages of of the New Testament. St. Paul Christ died for us, he says. And what can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or hardship? Can persecution, hunger, nakedness? Peril of the sword? We are being done to death, but I stake all day long, as scripture says. For I am convinced that there is nothing in death or life, in the realm of spirits or superhuman power, in the world as it is or the world as it shall be, in the forces of the universe, in heights or depths, nothing in all creation 
that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So my good people, waste your life occasionally. it will be given to you. Spend and you get something back. In fact, in the divine order, the only way to get power is to lose. Really. If we hoard our strength, we lose it. Give it in the service of labor, we get it back. The good Lord will never be outdone in generosity. And carry away with you then the example of, of the pencil. And let the Lord write with you. He will communicate messages through you. He will do good to others in his name. Visit the sick. Help the poor. Console the afflicted. This is prolonging the incarnation. You're here to receive strength, but then when you leave here, you have to spend it. As you waste your life, then you'll become richer and richer and richer in the kingdom of God. That will do for today's meditation. And I will tell you more. Now I'm going to talk about the devil. The relationship with the little flower. Which is long away from this subject. But at any rate, it has something to do with the primacy of Christ about which we have been talking today. So thank you. Bye and bye-bye.